Hello, and welcome to Thinkers 50 Radar 2022 series, brought to you in partnership with Deloitte. I'm Des Dearlove. And I'm Stuart Craner. We are the founders of Thinkers 50, the world's most reliable resource for identifying, ranking and sharing the leading management ideas of our age, ideas that can make a real difference in the world. In this weekly series of 45 minute webinars, we want to showcase some of those ideas to bring you the most exciting new voices of management thinking. So please let us know where you are joining, joining us from today and send over your questions at any time during the session. Our guest today is Paul Carlisle. Paul is Professor of Management and Information Systems and the Senior Associate Dean for Innovation at Boston University Questrom School of Business. Before coming to Questrom, he was on the faculty at MIT Sloan School of Management. His research focuses on the knowledge boundaries that exist among people in different expertise domains. And he's one of the world's foremost experts on what can be done to address those boundaries to enhance collaboration and innovation. And he's used this expertise to develop and design ways to drive innovation in the automotive, software, aerospace, and pharmaceutical industries. In his recent book, uh, Reimagining Business Education, Paul, along with the other Questrom colleagues, outlined strategies to address the highly specialized and siloed nature of higher education. The book proposes new approaches to teaching and research that generate more value for a broader set of stakeholders. At Questrom, Paul has put this into practice with the launch of an integrated and experientially based Master of Science degree in Management Studies, called the MSMS, that was cited as the most innovative business school idea of 2015 by Poets and Quants. So, Paul, welcome. Um, before we get on to talking about business education and, and potential disruption to business education and, and where, where it's all going, can you start by just giving us a little bit of an idea of your own personal journey? How did you get to where you are today? Yeah, well, th thanks, uh, both of you, for having me on. And, uh, yeah, the journey's a long one, but maybe to be... Uh, in the early 80s, I was in the startup world, uh, back when the startup world was a very scarce uh, place. And so uh, not a lot of roadmaps, not a lot of uh, best practices out there. So I guess I got my desire and my love for independence, for pushing the envelope, and also relying on a team of people, uh, of people uh, you work with. Um, then I chose an academic uh, approach and you know, did my PhD and went that way. In terms of the research, you know, the research I was doing in the 90s was when organizations, was, this was kind of pre-open innovation, right? This was still the more, the siloed approaches to innovation, but nevertheless, how to do that. So that's where I kind of cut my teeth on back when concurrent engineering was cutting edge, et cetera. Um, and then when I was a young professor at MIT, um, I started working with Kareem Lakhani when he was a, a doctoral student there. And, and we started working on the realm of open innovation. And so that's in some ways um, really changed the way I thought about value creation. So how do we reach out outside the boundaries, not of just the silos, but of the organization to create value? And so in some ways that's kind of pushed me a little bit more in terms of, uh, you know, um, how do we change higher education? How do we open ourselves up? Because historically higher education is a very closed system you know, highly credentialed, high, you know, that type of thing, but which makes it a little bit more insular and closed. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating because because you, you get that strange paradox with business education where, you know, business schools teach people how to how to how to innovate and how to do all these things. And yet I always think, you know, the business school world looks like it, it's so ripe for sort of disruption and, and for innovation itself. Um, and we're, I think, we, you know, we are finally seeing that in terms of, you know, some of the some of the online courses and stuff. But I mean, you're very much in the vanguard, though, of of bringing innovation, bringing business schools to innovation or innovation to business schools, wh whether it's kicking and screaming, <laughs> it may be. But um, tell us a little bit about how that's how that's gone down and how that's working. Yeah, I think um, in 2015 or 2014, we held a, a kind of a business education jam where we invited authors, practitioners, academics to kind of say, you know, what's, what are the challenges of business education? Because at this time, this was still when the post-recession was still there and there was a lot of negative press on business education. And a couple of things, you know, there was online issues, there was experiential learning, how to make it more practical. 
but one of my big takeaways from that was to say how how can business education create more value while charging the same price and that of course gets to openness how do you open it up to create more value and the other one was how do we lower the price while still maintaining the quality the value and so in some ways that kind of 2014 learning from that was begat you know the MSMS program which is in very much you know a high a higher a traditional price but this you know deep experiential learning which allowed greater value creation and then the program we launched in 2020 which was the online MBA was a mechanism to lower the price but still deliver the same kind of value and of course that's a that was a different kind of experiment because it got me into the realm of scaled how do you create quality at scale whereas the MS MS program was a traditional you know 30 point 40 per, uh, person face-to-face -face classroom experience. So in some ways, you know, those are, those, those began the, the two pathways of experimentation. Yeah, in many ways, the, the online MBA is kind of the holy grail of uh, business schools. And Christopher Sprague from Dublin, New Hampshire, uh, asked, asked a question about the launch of the Questrom's online MBA. How does innovation challenge existing strategies? And he says, this opens up the closed system, uh, disruption enabled by new business models. And we, I mean, Des and I have been writing about business schools for, for a long time. And I mean, they, they, were, they were ahead of the game really in the 1970s and 80s with distance learning. Actually, mm -hmm. some, some, someone like Henley in the UK was really ahead of the game. And then they seemed to, seemed to lose their way. And, T tell us more about the, your, your, your own on, online MBA and how you've kind of squared that particular circle, Paul. Yeah, I think in some ways, if you think about business models of three types, right, there's a kind of a product business model, which was, you know, kind of dominated basically the 20th century, where we, there's a set of experts inside of an organization who define the product. And then, of course, as software as a service became more of an approach and we had a digital infrastructure, then service became the focus of it. So how do we have a connection to the end user, learn from them rapidly so we learn to adapt uh, the software? So we, that shift from product to service. And now the big shift we're seeing um, is much more to a, a ecosystem where, which is truly open, right? Service opened itself up a little bit. The ecosystem, you know, even you could call those, you know, platform business models is another thing. So I think this kind of journey of openness. And so a little bit in the context of the online MBA, this is why instead of having the faculty define the problem of focus, it, which may, you know, an accounting problem or an operations problem or a strategy problem, this is why when we realized that the untapped market was the adult learner, was to say adult learners want to focus on a problem that they can apply tomorrow, a solution tomorrow. So this is why we allowed the modules to be business problem focused, which then of course required that the curriculum be integrated across different disciplines. And then the third element that we brought into that evolutionary path that was to say, and then how do we add peer to peer on top of that, because with adult learners, this is a lot. This is how you turn the high volume of this program. We have, you know, classes 400, 500 people mm -hmm. in them. This is allow what you might call high volume. Actually, you turn it into a scaled network <laughs> and allow the peer to peer to operate. And of course, that's um, what we have found with adult learners. They have a tremendous amount of expertise. Um, the question is, how do we set a table with you know, the principles that the faculty teach, the templates or the uh, frameworks or an organizing uh, set of ideas so that they can also leverage that peer to peer, uh, this, the, the adult learners uh, expertise and knowledge. So that's that's a that's both a business model pathway, but then it begat these kinds of actual things, how we design the program itself. No, so that's really um, sort of fascinating. I mean, obviously, classically, one of the one of the great benefits of going to a business school and doing an MBA was the was the network. But you're actually you, you're, you're turning the network into it. it's it's the MBA as ecosystem almost. You're talking about you know because you're opening it up to to the peer to peer learning as well as the as, as well as the you know breaking out of just the silos. But as I understand it, I'm, I want to talk about the. MSMS in a minute as well. Yeah. But you know, see, that's the that's the other model that you were describing. But in terms of the online MBA, so so it's basically there's, there's six modules. Yes, yeah, six the, modules. 
and people can complete this over uh, uh, you can do it in a couple of years i mean two years yeah, it's you can, a, if you go full-time yeah. it's a it's a two-year experience yeah so so give us a flavor of those modules and how they how they sort of fit together how they sit together well, maybe I could just start with, I mean, we have an orientation module, which is we okay. teach in team union communication and they get used to the technologies we'll be using. That's yeah. one of the essential elements of any online experience. But just to maybe go with module one as an example, it's, you know, creating and capturing value for business and society. So it's a, that's a big theme. Uh, what we, so in some ways we have kind of a bookend where we have our, the professor of Venkat Venkatrama who's you know, experienced in both strategy and technology. So he sits kind of the, what we would call connected capitalism. Some people might call it stakeholder capitalism. The fact that it is a much more connected world and value um, is created and captured by a larger set of people. So that he sets the stage in that part. And then we have um, Tal Gross who comes in and teaches what would say in you know, industrial economics, but he provides that perspective. And then we have currently Gordon Birch teaches the um, information economics, which would come uh, next. And if you think about those two things, historically, a more tangible good economics and a digital good economics, those are taught as completely separate things, never to come together. <laughs> and then Venkat comes back at the end and then they go through a capstone project at the auto industry, which if you think about it, has characteristics of industrial economics and has characteristics of information economics. And it's the hybrid of those two that in some ways a lot of our society is, is trying to work out. How will that come together? Because it will, and then there will be physical good elements and digital good elements that come together. And the solutions won't be by one company either, right? The solutions will be much more of an ecosystem. So that would be an example of how to have that kind of narrative, but then place the, what, what we might say, the, the academic content within that journey. So it comes alive, not only to learn it as a, as a skill, but also to, as it comes alive, to think about solving problems in, in, in the industry they're studying in, in the module or the industry that they might uh, be in. So to, if I understood you correctly at, at the beginning, you, you, this, is the, this is the part which is the maintaining quality, but, but reducing the, the, the price point. So, so what is what, what is the price point for, for, for your online MBA? What what sort of money are we talking about? So, uh, the the current price for the online MBA is twenty four thousand. So oh, considerably wow. less. Yeah. Um, than um, our face to face. But what we also identified is that historically, business education in some ways hasn't been great at market segmentation. <laughs> they had one dominant product. Um, you know, there's the undergraduate, which is a nice product. But then there's the dominant MBA product, you know, and there was a little executive ed or executive MBA or part time things. But uh, what we found actually based on another experiment that we ran, we did a MicroMasters program, which was globally distributed. And what we found from that is there's a lot of adult learners in the world who don't want to move to Boston, <laughs> um, work for great companies, are great, have great school districts, have great family life, but they're hungry for the lifelong learning. So in some ways, that gave us a sense that there is a large demographic there. So that segmentation also allows us to say the adult learner also brings to the conversation in some ways more value because they're not looking to switch careers, right? They're looking to expand their career, move up, uh, you know, move maybe from a specialty side of the business to a more general side. So in some ways, they're, they're, they, their value proposition is very, very different. And again, what we found is that those bright lines are holding because what a, what a full-time MBA, you know, you need an internship. So you need all those experiences to be able to switch careers and move that way. Whereas this adult learning audience um, does not. And I think also the low price also um, allows us to scale with the online because the online market that's high price, which is the traditional online market is, is expensive. And so this is why the question of scale uh, became the nut we had to crack. So how do we do quality at scale, which gets, again, business problem, integrated curriculum, peer to peer becomes kind of a necessary journey that we define for ourselves. And then the power of the network in some ways is not, you know, I think, Stuart, you mentioned in the beginning, the power of the network is why you come. But we're going to actually use the power of the network in the day to day learning in a more in a more direct and deliberate fashion. What about the role of uh, 
academics, Paul, I mean, without generalizing, well, actually, I've, I, by generalizing, I would, I would say that the, the academics in business schools haven't been um, great adopters of open innovation in, historically. Have you, have, you had to, have you encountered uh, attitudes you've had to uh, change amongst your academic colleagues? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, in, you know, in some ways one would expect, you know, you know, this is a highly credentialed industry, you know, you know, I, I'm an example of that myself in terms of the amount of time I spent on a PhD and, and, and getting through the tenure system. So we could be one of the most extreme cases of, of this deep, deep investment in specialization. So even a little bit like when, you know, I spent some time with NASA when they were going through that process, right? They were the specialists, they were closed, right? And then they had to open themselves up both to innovate faster, but also to show their value more to the world. And I think that's a little bit of, of the, the, um, the same process that we're going on. So I think also getting maybe even a little bit to the learning architecture, what it becomes is, and even to the level of the asynchronous material, you can put all that content there, right? That's the lecture, that's the stuff. But what it shifts then is the experience with the faculty, we do this in our live sessions, then has to be about its application, has to be about its extension. And so this is why you start to think about the role of the faculty. Yes, they have to have some expertise around a framework, around an industry, around the history of evolution of a given industry or you know, whatever the particular subject matter is. But they also then have to be stronger facilitation skills. And then I'm gonna use a, a, a quasi fancy word here. Then we think about the orchestration, right? So you're, you're facilitating conversation, but you're really thinking about, you know, where in the learning architecture of the week, now, of course, the designers help with that, right? Our instructional designers help with that thing. So we're orchestrating this collective conversation where these 500 people who are experienced across the globe in various things can engage themselves with technology. We have various technologies that allow that engagement to happen. So in some ways, it, it, it takes the traditional skill set of I'm the expert, I'm taking the knowledge in my head and giving it to you, but then adds layers on top of that, the facilitation layer and then the orchestration layer. So my, you know, our goal is always to preserve the expertise, preserve that inclination, but expand the role that they are playing. And, it, and it's not easy. I mean, I've had to go through this evolution myself. No, it sounds fascinating. Um, let's talk a little bit about the experiential learning and, and the MSMS, because that was the one in, in 2015 that the poets and quants were, were excited about. Um, and, and, and that was, that seemed to me a, a very different sort of program in the sense that it was, it was, I mean, I know you've built on it since with the online MBA, but the, 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 the actual notion of, of the, the, the curriculum not being a curriculum so much is just driven by projects. Yeah, that was, um, I mean, you know, I have done a lot of, quote, experiential learning. You know, when I was at MIT, I developed a, a program with Don Lessard for BP, right, when they were trying to uh, expand their project management skill set. So it became very applied, you know, right? So I, I'd seen that experience with executive education where companies want to invest. Mm -hmm. But it's been harder to do that experiential learning with undergrads or MBAs because you need that deep investment <laughs> from the other side. Um, and so the analogy I often use is that when we did experiential learning in MBA or, or the undergrad, it was often just a bolt-on that happened at the end. And so what I wanted to do and what we as a, as a team, um, you know, um, did is we kind of wiped the slate clean and we said, how about if we make the actually the, the partnership with the company, the central organizing unit, <laughs> what is that problem? And then you start to think to yourself and what are the pedagogical devices, the order of what we would need to teach things. So it's a, a process of self-discovery. And so that core, that is a year long program. And, and, it, and um, you know, Fred Geyer is the new director today. He runs it. But the model still holds out, which is the first module, the first half of the first semester is a lot of simulation where they are learning to the, the language of business, but to apply it to a setting and being comfortable with making mistakes, because that's another strong mantra of me is I'd rather experiment than be right. That's that's just my holistic mantra, how I lead people. Um, 
So that was module one. And then module two, then they would work with a real organization. It would start a smaller, maybe a retail firm, right? Trying to work with that. And then the third module, you would work for, you know, another firm that may be having an operational question, so more complex. And then the fourth module, you would be working with a company who would be, you know, a more complicated issue around strategy or cultural change or something like that. So in some ways, it's a very kind of controlled set of experiments to kind of allow the experiential learning to accumulate in, um, in the, in, 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 and again, the faculty there are both experts, but they are facilitators and orchestrators, but it's again, more in the realm of a, a 40 plus person classroom. And maybe other one little thing I'll throw in here is the fundamental thing of education. And this, I know I'm going to get maybe deeply philosophical about this is at the end of the day, we have methodologies that we use to impart knowledge, right? If I teach accounting, I'm going to use that method to assess if you know counting or not, right? So, so again, whether you frame that as a method or a how or an assessment, but when we really think about the holistic approach to business education is we actually have to get the student to realize they are the method. And then they have a lot of things that they can pull and choose from because, you know, that's the beauty of business is that, business will always continue to evolve and change because of competition, because of new technologies. And so it's really about, you know, and the MSMS, even though they were younger students, it was about allowing them to accept that responsibility, that they are the method. And, um, and that maybe changes how you think as a teacher, right? You're not always just trying to say, how do I assess if you know what I taught in the lecture? So, so what happens to the traditional lecture then? Do, do, do they, I mean, you know, you, are people pulling in the the expertise as they, it seems to me they're pulling it in as, as sort of as they need it, rather than it being just laid out and spoon fed to them and a certain sort of um, prescribed structure. But I, I can't quite sort of um, visualize how that, how that actually plays out. Yeah, I, mean, I think one way you have to think about it is, is as a designer, you have to think about how do you design with the end in mind? I think when you do a traditional classroom, here's my 14 lectures, and I go through them. If now, if you pre-place this experiential uh, problem to solve with a company, is that's the end in mind. And then what you do, then you just reverse engineer and think about when would I need to bring in which things to do that, which may actually change the order of how you would have traditionally done it. You may actually think about there may be a subject matter that's really not essential here. It may be essential later. And it may be essentially taught maybe more from an ops person than, than a marketing person. And so the, the integrated team is having those kinds of conversations. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's, so, so in some ways there are traditional lectures, but they are always the cadence of those and the content of that cadence has to be rethought. And it's maybe the module one, which I mentioned around the simulation, that's the more traditional setting, a lot more lecture, a lot more things because they're, they're working to the simulation. I'll just maybe say one other thing is in that degree, we went to pass fail because the other thing that you have to think about is if you have 10 teams doing a simulation and the winners, there's only one winner, then where does all that other knowledge go? So instead, if we had a simulation, which we would run every two weeks, everybody would share what they're learning, which means everybody can get better. And so in some ways, you know, one of the characteristics of, of you know, education in general is that we put scarcity on sharing what people are learning, right? It's a highly individualized sport, whereas business is not an individual sport. So that's, um, we went to the pass fail to open up that possibility Yes, to, to to stop people. I mean, I guess being in direct competition and seeing seeing yeah. each other as, um, as as competitors to some extent. Yeah, in some ways you have to kind of they have to go through almost a cultural re reframing, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what they've been used to. Yeah, yeah, that's that's how we. Um, and, and of course, raised. the MSMS MS students are younger, right? It's like you know they're they're twenty two, twenty three. It's inherently a younger audience for that degree. I remember t talking to a business school professor a while ago, and we said. How, how did you become a business school professor? What was the motivation? And he said, uh, I wanted to be an expert in something. And, and it's, it's, it seemed fair enough. He, therefore, he became a business school professor. But now if they're facilitators, orchestrators, and they've got to do this all on a kind of global basis, their content's got to be global. 
does it does it change the nature of academic research and the, and the job of academics fundamentally i mean i think i think that's kind of shifts are also going to be happening as well um in some ways you know what makes the life of a business school academic kind of unique if you go back to my notion of a product based business model there's two products they make they make a classroom teaching setting and they make articles <laughs> Those worlds often do not chat with each other, right? Uh, those are very separate worlds. And so that's the, that's the challenge that we have. And so if you think about the evolution to service and to an ecosystem role of, you know, facilitate or orchestrate, that staircase is happening, right? So the question is, how do we take the research staircase and how do we turn that into a staircase? And my, my fundamental hope, and I've drawn pictures of this in the book, is to think about how those staircases could actually connect. And so we even see this with, you know, our current Dean, Susan Fournier, who is focused on, you know, business, you know, institutes of various types. Um, so yeah, a, a digital, a, a digital institute, an institute on sustainability, things like those topics. And of course, these institutes are now increasingly multidisciplinary, mm -hmm. people from different departments. So if you think about that is, and of course they have to be connected to funding sources that could be the NSF or something else, but ideally they are connected to the world of more directly to the world of practice, a corporation, an association. So in some ways we're in the process of building that staircase as well. One could argue that could be a harder one to build. We'll find out. Um, but in some ways, you know, you know, you know, kind of a little bit of what it means is research a random walk. Because in some ways, there's a side of science that says it's always a random walk, right? I get to do what I want. But if we think through breakthroughs and innovations, those have not been random walks. This is where people come from different disciplines, lots of collaboration, whether intermediaries, intermediaries involved or companies involved, and, and, and allow that push through. We see this with COVID, right? This, this was not a random walk. This was a highly collaborative experience. And so in some ways these institutes could be that collaborative space. And so in some ways, just like openness was a way to think about the teaching staircase, openness is a way to think about uh, the research. Um, and, and then, you know, Stuart, to your point, then it evolves, right? It's not just a paper. Yes, it still needs to be a paper because <laughs> that doesn't go away. But, you know, even uh, with uh, biotechnology, you know, or, uh, you know, authorships went from two authors to 20 authors, mm -hmm. right? We saw that, that, that changed over the last 30 years. This may be a similar change in business as we think about what's required to solve, you know, global problems and how does business have a role in that? No, that's interesting. Um, I, I think we, 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 we shared last time we spoke, we, we, we talked about the fact that, you know, from sitting where we sit, in, in thinkers 50 watching the ideas that are that are that are increasingly relevant and important there was a time when they were much more siloed it was you know it was a it was a it was a strategy idea but now they're much more there's a much there's a great blurring of divides between you know different um what, what in, in in kind of business school world would be this different silos so uh, you know the innovation cuts across strategy which you know cuts across marketing there's there's a more of a, a mashup if you like of that stuff and you would expect to see that in reflected somewhere in in terms of of people doing interdisciplinary research um but as you as you say how you how you encourage that and how you and, and i guess it's competing for resources like everything else as well yeah. so i mean are you are you i mean obviously that there's there's progress going on um in your part of the world, um, do you, what about other parts of the world? What about Europe and, um, and and Asia? Do you see the same sorts of innovations in business schools, or is it? Do you feel you know that you're you're sort of the pioneers? Oh, I, I mean, I, I see it, but I, I think it's pocketed. You know, IE in Spain, I think, is a great yeah. innovator. Uh, I would say, you know, maybe the more extreme innovators in in Europe. Um, um, you know. Uh, parts of uh, Asia, it's happening there. I, I think one thing, you know, you know, disruption, as you know, is a very glib word. <laughs> you know, uh, disruption is a contact sport. And as we know, as an incumbent industry of which all education is, this is about fundamental uh, transformation. And I think one thing we should not fall in a trap of is to think that COVID somehow solved all this. 
COVID in some ways pushed Zoom on us, right? Because we had to come up with an alternative. The pandemic didn't necessarily reset the DNA of an incumbent mm. institution. Um, and, and of course, you know, it's hard to reset that, right? That's, that's, that's just the, the, the significant difficulty that we're under. Um, but I think going back to the questions of, you know, whether, whether it was a luxury 20 years ago to say a strategy problem is just a strategy problem, but certainly the world we live in today, whether you want to, want to call it climate change, trade, I'll just use the word peace. I think I can say peace yeah. on yeah. this conversation, given what's going on in the world. I think we see the, the tremendous interdependencies of society more clearly than we did 20 years ago, 30 years ago. There were some maybe some people who saw that, but I think even the average person sees that. And so I think this is what's also asking us uh, to see these wicked problems, however you want to frame these complex problems, that they have to be... Um, there has to be collaboration. And the question is, what's the infrastructure and the incentives and the, governor, the, the governance to allow that to happen? And, you know, like any incumbent industry, we have existing incentives and governance on the teaching side and on the research side that make, make that hard. And there's pockets that you can change more rapidly than others. And I would put that in the realm of, you know, where can I run the first experiment? to get some traction to prove that out. Where can I run the next experiment? So again, thinking about the MicroMasters, I, I largely took that outside of the system. It's, there's faculty involved, but it's a certificate. It doesn't get inside the machinery of that. That allows you to prove certain things out. And then the next step, the online MBA program, that's much more in the, the, the strong machinery of this, this, this incumbent organization that's you know, operated this way for a long time. So that's one way to kind of think about, I guess that's both advice on how to get the innovation going, but also as to why it's, it's hard. Uh, I think Arizona State in the U.S. Is, is, you know, significantly digitally transformed itself and how it approaches things. Uh, it embraces scale very much. Uh, we've taken an approach which is scale, but, and I'm using the word quality, they can, I'm sure they would feel that way. But in some ways, once you, once you get to sc scale, quality changes what was quality for a 40 person classroom mm. is just fundamentally different and i think that's you know if, if we were chatting if we were a bunch of online people i would say that's the thing that surprises me most fundamentally is every day i learn something new about scale mm. and how it's hard and how we and, and what it means to change truly change to to allow scale to be this positive force um, it's almost how you how you how you how you get um, how you leverage sort of network effects. Almost it's, it's it's that it's that sense of if you can get it so that scale becomes the advantage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like the, the sort of platform logic. Yeah, and I think this is a this is a really interesting. I mean, think about it. Back to you know, in some ways, I use I have a teaching note. I wrote the teaching note in Mod One, the product service platform ecosystem. Yeah. That's the one of the teaching notes used in Mod One. And we also talk about higher education as an example. Hmm. Now, so here's the, here's the particular challenge is a lot of, you know, traditional business platforms, um, you know, if you think about the, they're very good when the information product is defined, right? How you price it, how you organize that, how you generate network effects. But when it's fundamentally an innovation platform, that's harder. And so if you think about it and, you know, I think, I'm sure there's even some online MBA students hopefully listening today, but they are very much partners in the innovation. So not only how we deliver rubrics, how we do things, but the innovation is also the conversations on yellow dig, which is a, which is a kind of a Reddit style discussion board, which we use to facilitate the peer to peer that itself is innovation. You know, somebody who's in the, the finance industry and in the health industry wrestling with a common framework delivered by the faculty they're recognizing how it applies similarly, but yet different in two different industries. They then become the method, right? That's the, old, that's the ultimate kind of intelligence that we're trying to help everybody develop. That itself is innovation. So in some ways I've come full circle to realize that innovation is learning. And I think we've underthought what learning can be. And so that's, this is why for me, open innovation applies 
network effects as an innovation platform. So, you know, th think about a simple design decision. What's too constrained of a definition of a problem that may narrow the network effects versus what's too broad to a lot, uh, you know, but at scale, it may be different than you think when you tried it in the classroom. So those are the constant experiments that we're running because, you know, there's always a sweet spot that you have to try to pull off to make innovation work. Otherwise, it, it, it dampens the network effect or it becomes too, too, too watered down. People can't grab the value because in some mm -hmm. ways, how do we create value together, which is, you know, a node of a network effect. Mm -hmm. uh Rick Spann from Amsterdam points out that if we're talking about orchestration in business school education, we could also look fruit, fruitfully as, at music as a metaphor for the experiential learning you're talking about. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the jazz metaphor, I'm not, I'm not a jazz uh, person, although I played the trumpet in a previous life. Um, but the jazz metaphor has made its way into management thinking. You know, for those of you who know Carl Weick's work, he, he brought that in probably 30 years ago. But what's interesting there is that we have to become maybe the metaphor to compare it to symphony orchestra versus jazz. That's a, a useful comparison. The score and the nature of symphonic orchestration is much more about control. Now, there's inherent beauty to the oboe in a certain you know, Dvorak piece, right? There's an inherent beauty to that single or that, that sound. Um, but once we get to jazz, it is a little bit more free form. It's not chaotic, right? You tap a beat. Who's, who's the lead, but there's a lot more, there's less control to achieve a different kind of beauty. And I think a little bit when you move from a closed system to an open system, open systems still have forms of control, but they're very different forms of control. This is a little bit like, you know, teacher as expert, adding teacher as facilitator, teacher as orchestrator, right? That's, you still have those full three elements, but if you're just teacher as expert, your definition of control would be quite substantial. And so I think that's a little bit of maybe the jazz metaphor would be play out of, you know, leaving behind a, a set score, which at one level is beautiful, but it's, it's, it's highly controlled. Uh, and another, another question, Paul, how and why is an MBA still relevant? I think historically when people did MBAs, because, you could you could kind of measure their relevancy in the salary up, up, uptick after, afterwards. So how, how do you answer that kind of fundamental question of, of how and why they're, they're relevant and important to do? Because you've got an array of different qualifications and, and ways into business now. Well, you know, and I think in some ways our online MBA is interesting for that reason, because what you see maybe with our face-to-face -face MBA students, younger, career switching, they're coming to get a highly specialized MBA, which I think is probably appropriate for the world they're living in and maybe their inclinations, et cetera. But for our online MBA, the average age is 35, 37, 10, 12 years work experience. They've all been in maybe technical or, you know, project management, analytics, law, medicine, you know, um, accounting, finance. They've been in those elements of a business. And what they realize is that unless I have a kind of a 360 understanding of that language of business and the trade-offs to make, let alone the innovations to make, um, they feel like they're being held back. So in some ways, I actually think that our online MBA is putting a shining light on exactly what the MBA is. It is this integrative experience where you realize to create value, to push a positive thing, to be, you know, all the things you can think about in terms of the company's value or an individual value. It's essential because the MBA allows that collaboration across different languages, different value systems, because in some ways that's the beauty of business, right? Is it's a complicated thing. And one of my worries is, is if we step away from the MBA and treat it like a specialization, and I'm gonna say something quite strong here, I would refer to this as the tyranny of specialization. Mm. And I don't need to mention this, but if you think about the challenges of 2007 and 2008, what could you say explains what happened then? That mm. was the tyranny of specialization. Mm. And not understanding the ramifications of certain methodologies in the financial world. So, so in some ways I see, um, the values in some ways being proven out, uh, particularly amongst the adult learners. I mean, of course, the MBA was the classic 
um, stepping stone from from specialized to into general management. That's that's one of the functions that it, it always had. Um, so, I mean, I think that point's still valid. Um, Zahir makes a very good point. I think it goes to the heart of a lot of things we, we've been talking about. A cohort of 400 students is, in fact, a network of 400 value nodes who are not only learning, but bringing innovation to the program in their own unique sense. I think that's actually very well put. I think that's what yeah. I was trying to reach for with the, you know, to some extent with the network effects and what we've been talking about. But it, that does change the, the, the model so fundamentally. It, it disrupts the model in the sense that you no longer have, you know, the, the teacher, the all knowledgeable teacher standing up front. You, you, you've now got you've now got this dispersed um, knowledge, almost um, distributed expertise as well. I mean, it's it's just it it turns the whole thing on it on its head. Does yeah. that? Would you, do you, sorry, I let you. Well, I was going to say, I, first of all, I love the Zahir's. Uh, that was a really great telling of it, and I I, 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 I agree, agree completely with him. And maybe what I would add, let's say a traditional model, let's say a traditional undergraduate model of freshmen. Maybe, maybe the faculty member. Um, has 90% of the knowledge, right? That will take place over the course of yeah. that semester. You can imagine as a concept, as you can imagine that a complex that, that Zahir is describing is maybe the faculty member has 50% of that knowledge, less than that. Now, the question is what that knowledge is becomes really, really essential in terms of that ability to, what are the, what are the principles of economics? Um, how are those used in a given industry and how might that be extended to another industry? And then as that's delivered, that becomes then the, you know, the how, the, the what, how and why that the people in that distributed network then generate all that other knowledge in ways that as a, you know, what we know about an open innovation is that you could never predict what's going to get created by that network in a million years, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is where as the network affects fire, it creates so much stuff that becomes both global, right? Because that's how it's achieved, but it's locally relevant and sourced. Mm -hmm. So it's that, you know, it's, you know, you know, it's, you know, how do you, how do you make global and local work? That's how you make it work. But you have to kind of, you have to, you know, take the control away or you have to allow the openness to, 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 to work its magic. Now, again, you can't be completely, uh, open in the sense of, of, of things like that, but it's a very different uh, model and it has a lot of, and maybe thing I would say just to partially to elongate, but going back to, if I have 18 year olds in the classroom, that's a different animal, right? Now I still need to look for opportunities for that. So the MSMS program, now if yeah. you go back to, if we ran that conversation, how do I get them so those network effects can, can fire? with people who don't know a lot. Well, I have to give them all this real world experience through the experiential learning so they can become this rich, you know, network effect. Um, so I have to, whereas if I only gave them tests all the time and no access to the real world, the faculty would still be 90% of the knowledge production. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully that helps. Yeah. No, it's very good. Where, where does this lead then, Paul? Where, 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 how do you think your programs will be different and shaped differently in, in five, ten years' time? Where, look, look, looking further, further ahead. Oh, good question. I, I, I think you know, you know, because I think you know, you know, listen to somebody like Zahir. You know, so if he's a part of a network that is constantly producing knowledge, he wants to stay a part of that network. So I often use the analogy, just like the Toyota supply chain was so valuable, you couldn't afford to leave it. Now, why was that? Because the learning in the supply chain was the power. And so, you know, my hope is that to deliver on lifelong learning is we have to create that, that network has to be the value. If lifelong learning is I'm the expert and I'm telling this network out there what they need to do and believe, I think that's not going to have the network effects. So, so I, I think, you know, that's kind of the next set of experiments we're going to be engaged in is, is how to, um, now that we understand what it looks like a little bit with these Amba students, how do we replicate that for them when they leave, for our other alumni, for alumni from other universities, for executive education? And so I want to keep this, this kind of momentum going. Because the other thing I'd say is that people do want community when they learn. And um, I think that's behind a little bit of finds here's comment, right? It's a community, it's a network, it's, it's, it's friends, it's, it's all those things. Right. Um, and uh, I think that's, 
the opportunity that I want to continue to do. And I think um, that will make the world a better place not to get to a platitude. But as we get to this common shared learning networks, that's going to help the world, right? Solve problems, see what we have much more in common that we don't have in common. We're actually running out of time, but um, let me just ask you a final question. Um, how does all this that we've talked about, does it alter the skill set that, that people working in your industry need to bring? I mean, do we, are, you, are we still going to be recruiting the same people? I mean, we have seen, I think, uh, um, an input of former executives. You've got much more practitioner-based people now, I think, you know, kind of coming into business schools as well as alongside the academics. But does this does this new model, do these new sorts of experiments change the sort of people that you need to recruit? That question. I, I would say it does, but it's a little bit like the, the market segmentation we see in the industry out there. Maybe there's a, an internal segmentation because a little bit like the staircase of the, the teaching staircase and the research staircase, those still may be very different people, right? Hmm. Um some of those people may be overlapped. Like some people are, can teach executive ed, right? Some people can't. Hmm. Um, the people who are good at executive education obviously do well in but because they're used to that. They, they see their role as the translator, right? Not the, yeah. you know, this is the way it is with everything. So I do think about there are, as the clinical professors, professors of practice, those segmentations are happening here and other places. The key there is to put them in the roles where they are, most effective at if, if I think about the two different staircases and then the, the goal to maybe bring the staircases together, that would be interesting. Where would we deploy them? Okay. And where can people go to, if they want to find out more about, I mean, obviously the books available for more good bookshops um, and, and I guess to come to the question site to find out more about the courses we've been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Those would be, and then maybe when the call is over, we can think about how to make those available. Uh, on your website, ours, and then um, and they can talk to our students too. <laughs> Perfect. Paul, thank, thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, Paul, someone, and Questrom truly disrupting business education, making, making us all rethink about it, its role. Um, next week, we're joined by Tom van der Loop, who's somebody who's actually disrupting financial services, and uh, which is an interesting... Uh, story and uh, putting ideas into practice once again. Thank you everyone who's joined us from throughout the world and thank you for your, your questions and we look forward to seeing you all again. And thank you, Paul Carlisle. Thank you, Des. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks.